How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. These are the few lines said by our favorite detective, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Isn't that what us doctors do as well? Hi, I'm Ritika and in this video, we shall be discussing the case given to me for the Dr. Sherlock The Science of Deduction competition. So without wasting any time, let's get right into it. A 27-year-old man presents to the outpatient clinic complaining of two days of facial and hand swelling. He first noticed swelling around his eyes two days ago along with difficulty putting on his wedding ring because of swollen fingers. Additionally, he noticed that his urine appears reddish-brown and that he has had less urine output over the last several days. He has no significant medical history. His only medication is ibuprofen that he took two weeks ago for fever and sore throat, which have since resolved. On examination, he is afebrile with heart rate 85 beats per minute and blood pressure 164 over 98. He has period vital edema. His fundoscopic examination is normal without arteriovenous nicking or papilledema. His chest is clear to auscultation. His heart rhythm is regular with a non-displaced point of maximum impulse and he has no abdominal masses or bruise. He does have edema of his feet, hands and face, a dipstick urine analysis in the clinic shows specific gravity of 1.025 with 3 plus blood and 2 plus protein but it is otherwise negative. Oof, lot of words, right? Let's break it down, shall we? So, our patient has facial and pedal swelling since two days, hypertension, oligurea, hematuria and proteinuria. There appears to be no sign of any respiratory or cardiovascular abnormalities and no abdominal masses or bruise. This suggests that our patient could have acute kidney injury. Now, when you suspect acute kidney injury in any patient, the first and foremost thing that you should do is USD abdomen, urine analysis and RFT to rule out the pre-renal and post-renal causes. USD abdomen and urine analysis is usually normal in pre-renal causes. Now, under renal causes of acute kidney injury, we have vascular, glomerular and tubular interstitial. Muscular causes in could include large vessel diseases like atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis or small vessel diseases like HUS malignant hypertension or scleroderma renal crisis. Scleroderma is a chronic multi-system disorder with characteristic thickening of the skin and there's appear to be no sign of uh, such in our patients so that rules out scleroderma renal crisis. Malignant hypertension usually presents with uh, blood pressure above 200 over 140 and is defined with the presence of papilledema accompanied with retinal hemorrhages and exudates, which again excludes that. HUS would present with the history of blood and diarrhea that is dysentery and it is commonly due to the infection of E. coli. There is absence of edema in atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis since there is intravascular volume overload. So that excludes atherosclerotic RAS. Now we have tubular interstitial disorders, which is also called acute tubular injury or acute interstitial nephritis or acute tubular necrosis. Tubular interstitial causes usually have protein traced to plus one with no hypertension. So that excludes acute interstitial nephritis. Albumin plus two to plus three presence of hypertension most likely corresponds to glomerular cause. Now let's see what are the glomerular causes. We have two classic presentations that is nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome or RPGM. Acute onset, presence of edema, raised blood pressure, proteinuria, hematuria and oligouria highly suggest that our patient can have nephritic syndrome or RPGM. We have been given with this histological picture which shows endocapillary and mesangial hypercellularity that is diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. In RPGN, there are characteristic crescents which are not seen in this picture, again which rules out RPGN. So now the most likely diagnosis becomes nephritic syndrome or acute glomerulonephritis. Now I would like to point out that in our case there was a history of fever and sore throat two weeks ago, that is a pharyngeal infection. That leaves us with two differentials, 
IgA nephropathy or Berger syndrome and post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Now, IgA nephropathy, the hematuria occurs 24 to 48 hours after pharyngeal or GI infection. While in post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, we have presentation of nephritis 1 to 4 weeks after streptococcal infection of pharynx or the skin. A patient had the history of fever and sore throat 2 weeks ago which makes PSGN our most likely diagnosis. This diagnosis can be confirmed by serological test. We could check for uh, serum C3 levels which will be low in PSGN and we can check for circulating antibodies against streptococcal antigen which are ASO and anti-DNASB. Immunofluorescence microscopy reveals diffuse granular deposits of IgG and C3 giving rise to a starry sky appearance. More extensive immunoglobulin deposition throughout the glomerular capillary wall gives us garland pattern which is associated with a poor prognosis. Now for the management, we have two modalities. First, we need to treat the infection. Then we need to give the supported treatment. Penicillin G can be used for the treatment of the infection. If the patient is uh, allergic to penicillin G, we could go for erythromycin. For supportive measures, we need to monitor blood pressure, volume status and serum potassium levels and give ACE inhibitors and diuretics accordingly. So that sums up our discussion for this case. I hope I was very clear in how to clinically approach the case, the differentials and how to get to the most probable diagnosis, its confirmation and the management. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and thank you so much for spending your precious time in watching this video.